This is the spindle from my Victorian radial arm drill, which I had just spent an awful long time getting it out of its bearing. And the object of today's video is to put it back again, but hopefully in a manner that means it will work as was originally intended by the makers all those years ago. Before we can do that, there are some hurdles to overcome because unfortunately it did sustain some damage. There is a fairly nasty crack around the bottom end of the bearing, which opened up as the top of the spindle burst out towards the end. I didn't really notice it till I got up from the floor. So dealing with that repair is the number one priority. But before we do any of that, let's just take a few steps backwards and examine why it was so stuck in the first place. Normally, when you have some very stuck parts, it takes a lot of effort to get them shifting initially. But once they've shifted, then the process gets easier and easier and easier, and everything starts moving again. You might even be able to push the part back a little bit or get it rotating. All these things help to circulate oil around the stuck area and dislodge any crud and rust that might be causing the issue. But in the case of these two, it was the total opposite. It got moving and then it got harder and then it stayed hard all the way to the bitter end. Why on earth was that? Well, I've been mulling it over and I have some suspicions. To confirm those suspicions, we've got to do a little bit of measuring. First measurement I want to take is this end of the spindle up here. It's got no rust on it. In fact, it's still a little bit oily. So we're going to measure that. So it's a shade over a two and a quarter inch, 10 pounds. 2.26, don't know why it's 10 thou over two and a quarter, but that's what they decided to do. This end is covered in lots of glass hard, very scaly rust. And that is 2.27. That's a uh, 2.65 and right up here 2.65 and there is the thickest spot which is 2.271 which is 11 thousandths thicker than the unrusted end why is that well let's do the same measurements on the bearing That is 2.269. Let's just do it again. A little bit deeper. And somewhere where it's not damaged or there is no rusty keyway. And that is 2.266. And 2.66 again. Two. Point two six six. Okay, so that is five thousandths smaller than the big end of there and six thousandths bigger than that original surface. I'm not surprised, that's probably just tolerance. But that explains why that was so hard to get through that bottom end. But that still doesn't explain how that got thicker. If it was contained inside this bore all the way through, it's physically impossible, no matter how rusty it can get that it can actually swell by that much. So let's measure the other end. And it's already quite a lot bigger. That is 2.315. Because up to about there, is bored larger for clearance. This bore stops here and then further up it is quite a bit oversized. This is where that sat all this time. This end has been sticking out, hence why it's pitted. And then here is nice and clean. This area where that clearance bore is, which starts there, lines up with where this starts to get a lot thicker and also with the rust in the keyway. Because of the large clearance between this diameter and the diameter in there, water has been able to sit in there and do its nasty work. In the way that this is arranged, when this is inside of there, 
and the feed screw is slid over it, a lot of the feed screw is exposed to the elements, and so any water that's hit the feed screw has spiraled down the screw and into this area. And this has stayed pretty much constantly wet and full of water for the entire 40 years that this machine was outside. So no wonder it was so difficult to get out because essentially what we had between these two figures is a 5,000th interference fit, which is why it was only moving with the significant temperature difference. I should add that this interference fit was definitely a factor in causing the cracked end. Perhaps if I'd have heated this end at the same time as pressing it out, it could have perhaps been avoided. The likelihood is though, that the fracture was already there, perhaps caused by my beatings, or perhaps there from day one. We are where we are though, and it's time to effect a repair. Before that, the parts are having a good clean and a bath in chemical de-ruster. I'm using a brand I've not used before. It's called Built Hamber Deoxy and is strangely a powder and designed to be dissolved in water. I very quickly discovered that the water needs to be quite hot and because I don't have a hot water supply at the workshop, it was quite time consuming to get it to dissolve properly. But we got there in the end with a few kettles. There are a few parts that didn't get the molasses treatment because they were still stuck to something at the time. The main one being this cone pulley on the side of the head, which drives the feed shaft via that worm which is sandwiched inside the casting. It's freed up really nicely and I decided it wasn't worth the bother getting it out. It can be painted around and de-rusted in situ like this. I found a box that the spindle bearing fits into conveniently and a piece of soil pipe with the end sealed off is ideal for the spindle itself. In what's left of the bucket, I'm also going to de-rust the column top cap, which is also the bearing for the vertical shaft, as well as the hand wheel for the feed, which I repaired back in part 7. Time to let that do its work. After a rinse and a clean, there was still some rust deep in the pits, so I returned it to the solution for a second go. Let's see how that cone pulley's doing. So this is the second time out and that looks really nice. It's definitely done its job and we can now examine that damage properly. It is very nearly off. It has cracked all the way, annoyingly, plus that little one in the center. So really, it probably wants to come straight off. Oh, there we go. So looking at the inside of this break, we can see the grain structure of cast iron. We can also see the dark area on the lower right hand side of the break which indicates to me that a fracture was pre-existing here, probably from day one. All I did then was finish the job properly. Suspicion confirmed, that is definitely cast iron. So we're gonna carry on doing some prep work on this and see if we can get it welded.
I want to weld in the original broken piece, so decided to refit the spindle temporarily to act as a guide for the broken piece to sit on during welding. The top end of the spindle needed a bit of fettling first, but once those high spots on the pitted area were knocked down, it went in with some persuasion. I will do some further fitting work when it comes to doing the work on the spindle, but this fit will do for now. I'll start by preheating the whole area generally before bringing the joint area up to temperature for brazing. I decided to braze this joint mainly because it's a bearing surface that runs inside a tapered bronze bearing. With brazing, there's much less risk of creating any hard spots or inclusions in the weld area that could damage the bronze bearing further down the line. The repair will also be out of sight, so the visible contrast between the bronze and the iron is not so much of an issue. I don't have a lot of experience brazing, but I think this went pretty well, and I definitely enjoyed doing it, and it's quite therapeutic once you get into the flow. Once I was happy with the repair, I wrapped it up to cool down slowly.
Once cooled down and some of the excess around the repair ground down, it's time to head over to the lathe and see about doing some machining. And this is where things got weird. I initially installed the part on the lathe using the central area of the bearing as a reference in the steady, thinking that would give me good access to machine my repair inside and out, and possibly re-skim both bearing surfaces. After clocking in the chuck end, it was immediately obvious something wasn't right, and there was some serious eccentricity going on towards the end of the bearing piece. I moved the steady down as far towards the end of the tapered end as I could go. Not ideal, but unavoidable at this point, and I checked the various surfaces with the DTI. This first surface is where the bevel gear sits that drives the whole bearing and the spindle inside it. This was clocking okay within five thousandths. I can live with that. The teeth on the 150 year old bevel gears aren't even machined, so they will cope with a few thousandths of eccentricity. Then if we move up to the upper conical bearing journal, you can see it's smoother, but running out a little further at around six thousandths. And moving to the middle area, it's pretty bad at nearly 15 thousandths of run out. A bit further up, it's even worse, over 15 thousandths. And then moving down to the lower journal, it's back to about 6 thou on the middle and about 8 thou on the upper portion. Measuring the portion running in the steady, we can see that the internal bore is pretty spot on if you ignore that lump, which is probably a bit of flux or something from the brazing. And on the outside, it's a few thousandths. Again, this is probably out of roundness from rust damage. Looking at these numbers, with the high reading in the middle, it looks bent at that point, and further investigations are needed. For now, I'll use this setup to clean up the repaired bore just far enough that we don't touch any iron, and I can always finish the rest up by hand when it comes to fitting the spindle. That is definitely sliding a lot easier than it was before. And despite what the weird DTI readings say, the fact that I can spin this proves one thing, and that is that the internal bore is not bent. And the obscurities that we were reading from the DTI earlier are on these surfaces. What I'm gonna do about that, I'm not sure yet. I expect it will have to be remachined on the lathe slightly, especially to bring those two bearing journals back into truth with each other. After all, I do want this drill to work properly, so any eccentricity between those two journals is just going to cause issues. I'm pretty sure there's enough material available to do that, but some more measurements are required to confirm. The eagle-eyed amongst you are probably horrified by the mess on the very end back there. Don't worry, I'll be dealing with that soon. But thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.